Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, this week marks the seventh anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street movement and 10 years since the collapse of U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers that triggered the onset of the global financial crisis. Millions of people in the United States and around the world lost their jobs, lost their homes and life savings, even as the U.S. government bailed out some of Wall Street's biggest failing banks. Over the weekend, activists in Europe protested outside banks in France and Germany to mark the 10th anniversary. The financial crisis also sparked massive global anti-capitalist movements, including the Occupy movement here in the U.S. and M15 in Spain and the anti-austerity movements in Greece. To talk more about the impacts of the crisis 10 years later, we're joined by Nathan Schneider, whose new book outlines an alternative economic model based on cooperative ownership. He argues the cooperative movement has witnessed a resurgence since the 2008 financial crisis. Schneider's book is just out. It's called Everything for Everyone. The Rat tradition that's shaping the next economy. His recent piece for Vice is headlined, Rich People Broke America and Never Paid the Price. He's also author of Thank You, Anarchy, Notes from the Occupy Apocalypse. Uh, Nathan Schneider is a journalist and author and media studies professor at University of Colorado Boulder. Welcome to Democracy Now! I just came from Boulder. Um, okay. uh, so, talk about this both 10th anniversary of what's called the economic collapse, but also 7th um, anniversary of Occupy, which you were very much a part of. Well, it's striking how little we are marking these anniversaries, right? Especially the anniversary of the, cra the, uh, the, of the crash, which has so defined the last 10 years and has defined my generation, has defined so many of our lives. I think a reason that we haven't been celebrating it is we recognize we really haven't done anything serious to deal with the causes of this crash and to deal with the horrific response to it, in which millions of people were allowed to lose their homes and their jobs. And uh, quietly, in the midst of this lack of imagination, there has been a growing uh, uh, movement on a grassroots level, uh, increasingly at a policy level, uh, to recognize that there is an opportunity to make a difference through this tradition of cooperative enterprise. Well, can you give some examples of that? Because, as, as you note, there's, there has been a a, a a a cooperative movement in America in p past decades as well, even before this crisis. But how do you see? Give some examples of uh, the changes that have occurred since the crash. Well, absolutely, there has been that long tradition, and it's. Uh, I mean, this is a tradition that has been. Uh, empowering farmers, that has been uh, uh, enabling small businesses to survive, but it's often not visible. You know, actually, in the course of working on this book, I learned that my own grandfather uh, uh, helped build a national purchasing cooperative for hardware stores, enabling small hardware stores to survive and thrive, you know. And I didn't even know that it was a cooperative. That was never something I, I learned. And um, in the years since the, the crash, um, for instance, there was, uh, a, in 2011, during Occupy, there was a large Move Your Money Day, where hundreds of thousands of accounts moved from big banks to credit unions, which are banks that are owned by the people they serve. Uh, there's been a rise in interest across the country, especially in cities, in worker ownership, in allowing workers to become owners of the businesses that where they're uh, employed. And this is increasingly moving uh, into to, uh, federal strategy, uh, and it's a surprisingly bipartisan opportunity. There's a quiet opportunity here uh, to really make good on the, um, the failure of our economic system 10 years ago. Mm. Well, but uh, some might argue that um, uh, even some predatory capitalists have come up with or are developing the idea of uh, cooperation uh, among business people. Uh, I'm thinking of Airbnb, uh, Uber, uh, this whole sharing economy. Uh, they're sort of taking co a cooperative idea uh, and standing it on its head in terms of how they can make money off. That's right. You know, cooperation was really the original crowdfunding. It was the original sharing economy. But I think most of us have kind of wised up to the fact that this is not a real sharing economy, this 
economy of Uber and Airbnb. This is an extraction economy. And a lot of what I've been following for the last few years is a group of people around the world who are trying to build real sharing economies using digital tools to share ownership and governance all the way down, to build gig economies where frontline workers are uh, deciding their own, their own standards of work, you know, house cleaners and, and, uh, and drivers and others. This is you speaking at Occupy Wall Street. The anniversary, seventh anniversary, was Monday, yesterday, uh, September 17th. But this is you speaking there, um, down at Zuccotti Park. What they're doing here is the assembly. The core demand, I think, right now seems to be um, the, de the, the right to organize, to have a political conversation in a public space, to show Wall Street, uh, so to speak, what democracy looks like. So that's you, Nathan Schneider, back seven years ago. And now you've written this book. Um, this radical tradition you're talking about, the cooperatives that are um, uh, on the upswing around the world, talk more about them specifically and what you hold out most hope for. Well, it, it's striking how that idea of practicing democracy in everyday life that was that was happening in that square um, is something that is a kind of hope that we've lost. Uh, it was something that, even in the 1930s and 40s, the U.S. government was promoting. Uh, it was something that, a possibility that was forgotten. In terms of these particular uh, projects, you know, we, we have uh, these gig economies in which uh, people are, are figuring out how to own and govern their own platforms. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, an opportunity, uh, unlike any we've ever seen, where a whole generation of business owners uh, in what's known as the silver tsunami are looking to retire. And these small and medium-sized businesses, employers around the country, are being gobbled up by uh, private equity. This is an opportunity for conversion to employee ownership, um, if we have the right policy tools and the right financing tools available. Um, so the opportunities that, we're, uh, that we have before us right now are tremendous. And these are also connected to our social movements. You know, the, uh, the, the platform for the Black Lives Matter movement uh, mentioned in its policy proposals cognates of cooperation more than 40 times. And this is just uh, uh, another example of the rootedness of our social movements in cooperative enterprise, uh, going back to the civil rights movement and long before. And, and what do you say to those who would argue that, uh, absent any kind of uh, change in the political power structure, that the, that the lawmakers will always come up with ways to keep these cooperative movements down and to maintain uh, monopoly capital or big capital uh, uh, in, uh, in favor status in a society. Well, the, the weird thing is, actually, this is something that's happening across the political spectrum, but quietly. You know, actually, both the Democratic and Republican platforms in 2016 uh, advocate increasing worker ownership. Um, now, in the last couple of years, uh, Democrats have been recognizing that this might be an issue that they want to take leadership on. Uh, uh, just a couple uh, uh, weeks ago, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act passed, which uh, facilitates uh, worker ownership and conversions of businesses. So I think, actually, we have an interesting opportunity in this moment of incredible polarization, and there's a political base already starting to form. We just need to strengthen that. And, 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 and make the demand uh, even louder, make the demand heard that that system that created the crash 10 years ago is not acceptable anymore. What's the difference between the gig economy and the rigged economy? <laughs> Well, I, I think a rigged economy, right, is one in which the, um, the, the accountability goes upward, you know, in which you have businesses that are ultimately accountable just to a small segment of uh, their shareholders, of, of big investors. They're not—when they have to make hard decisions, their accountability goes upward, and the people who are, say, on the line for uh, their mortgages are the ones who get let off. You know, the gig economy is— in a sense, an opportunity and a danger. The gig economy is a danger in the sense that it means it has often meant relinquishing things that workers have fought for for decades, for, for centuries. Um, but it also invites these opportunities of more flexible work. And we have an opportunity to, to, to create a future of work that in which workers are really in control. And finally, the fact that 
Who was held accountable for what happened and how much so many people lost 10 years ago? Well, I, I think we haven't really held anyone accountable nearly enough. And the, the, um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, or, or there was some talk uh, uh, for, for some seconds. of the time about uh, uh, who was not put in jail, things like that. I think we need to talk about the system. We need to transform the system, and we have a tool set. We have a tradition that is proven, that is actually bipartisan, uh, that we can turn to to make that difference. Nathan Schneider, media studies professor at University of Colorado Boulder, his new book, Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradition That's Shaping the Next Economy. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.